one plus one. Who? No, I can swap. I've got a guy micing up the guys for the dining talks. Right, okay, just the first two, because they're going to be swapping. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. All right. Okay, can everyone get seated? We'll get started on this. Uh, just a quick heads up. We're going to start running the buses from 5.20 onwards, but we are running them through till about 6.15. We're going to make sure we get everybody down to the Penguin Dinner, so don't fret, okay? If you want to leave early, that's up to you, but we want to start offloading everybody else as well. All right, so let's get things running. Our kickoff is Clinton and Tom talking about uh, PyCon Australia and Kiwi PyCon. Hello everyone, Tom and I decided to share a spot so that we don't uh, waste a slot. I'm here to uh, let you know that we're running PyCon Australia this year. Um, once again, it's in Brisbane. Uh, it's a tiny bit earlier this year, 30th of July to the 6th of August. Um, we run it uh, in a very similar structure to Linux Conf AU. We have keynotes, mini comps, a conference dinner, talks, and we have workshops. Uh, the background there is the very successful Django Girls workshop. Um, I'm around for the rest of the conference. If you've got any questions, come and find me. What he said, but somewhere nicer. Um, so a, a year ago, I stood in front of you all and explained that I had accidentally volunteered to run a conference. Um, now I know what a big mistake that was, but... Uh, through no fault of my own, it was actually a rousing success, and we had a fantastic time, and we had a stamp. Does LCA have a stamp? Yes. Stephen, do you guys have? We didn't need one. Yes, you did. You just didn't realize it. Um, <laughs> we had a really good time. We had two keynotes. We had Nick Coughlin join us, which was fantastic, and we had uh, a rocket scientist from the European Space Agency telling us about how Python predicts orbits. So if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. Um, and it was so much fun that we are going to do it all again soon. Wait for it. I like that one. In Christchurch this year. In September-ish. We will let you know as soon as we know when it will be. And that will probably be pretty soon, probably within the next week or two. The trouble is summer university, venue, booking, people are on holiday, you know how it goes. Um, that is the site. Right now it takes you to the New Zealand Python User Group webpage. So when, the, when the conference run-up starts, that will take you to the good place. And that is the official Twitter feed of the New Zealand Python User Group, which is where you will hear what you need to hear when you need to hear it. Um, come to Christchurch. It's going to be fantastic. Thank you. I think I'm working. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Daniel. Usually the activist cap stays off for the duration of the conference, but after Moglin's talk on Tuesday, I decided it could come on for three minutes. Um, so, uh, oh, my slides, I lost a slide. Uh, after Moglin's talk, um, he talked about we're already living in the, uh, the world we were afraid of. Thing, um, you know, he talked about what are the things you worry about in a totalitarian society, arbitrary detention, extraordinary surveillance of people and so on. So I got to thinking, where is this happening the most in the Australian political context? Um, many people will know the place highlighted on the left is Manus Island, it's part of Papua. Uh, on the right is Nauru. These are the two locations of Australia's uh, detention concentration camps. So um, many of us have seen the horrific photos of the conditions. Obviously this is where um, people on Manus sleep. Uh, temperatures regularly exceed 40 degrees. People get an allowance of about half a litre of water a day. Um, yeah, it's, it's horrific. This is a hunger strike that started last night. It's ongoing. There's about three or 400 of the men on Manus are on hunger strike. Uh, this is uh, Faru. He was born in Australia, but uh, unfortunately he's, um, his appeal uh, for his citizenship has been denied, so he's become a stateless person. Uh, this is Reza and uh, uh, Hamid. Uh, unfortunately, both of them have passed away on Manus. So uh, why am I talking about this and bringing the mood down? Well, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that many of the people who are in these camps really have an affinity with uh, the kind of struggles that we're in, the kind of stuff uh, Evan was talking about. Many of the people who have to flee do so because they're journalists and whistleblowers, uh, activists, queer people, and, and of course, uh, the, the, the minorities um, who you'd expect. Um, 
refugees living in the community in Australia are actually subjected to an incredibly intense uh, high-tech tracking and surveillance regime which actually has served as a prototype uh, for regimes that then get you know, rolled out uh, through Centrelink and things like that. And particularly the children going to school who are living in the community are, um, are falling back, particularly in their IT skills. They don't have access to laptops like many other students do. So um, I'm going to skip this a little. Uh, and obviously there's all the same things you expect um, in uh, situations like what Moglen was talking about. Um, lawyers not being given access um, to their clients. It's difficult for us to document what's going on there because we're, we're cut off uh, technically. So what we need are reliable, fail-safe channels into the camps. Uh, often when there's these so-called emergencies, the landlines are cut for weeks. It's easy enough to get stuff in there. There's, like, it's, it's not hard to smuggle things in, but it needs something that people can use discreetly and which will uh, withstand the weather conditions and allows people to hide things when there's searches and so on. So what we need is two things, and this is the real reason I'm here to ask uh, if anyone can give some advice, we need cheap laptops readily available for the kids in community detention in Australia, and we need a reliable way to uh, maintain communications with the camps, including when um, landline access is cut off. So if anyone has bright technical ideas there, I'd love to hear it. Thank you. Cool. Testing. After that, I think I need a beer. Not a problem. <laughs> okay, who here likes beer? Sounds like a couple of people had some already. Okay, at last year's LCA, I was talking with a mate and he told me a story that uh, he'd uh, been down to the local hardware store and he'd done a bit of IT work for them to fix up one of their computers and they paid him in a carton of beer. And that got me thinking of using beer as a method of payment. So, uh, if you are gluten intolerant, uh, like a celiac or just intolerant of gluten, please execute this and hopefully it makes it a bit better for you. So this is beer nomics, not beer nomics. The uh, Citizens Against Ruining Beer Sanctity will have very uh, blue, harsh words to say about you. Don't even mention a shandy in front of them. They can get quite, you know, touchy. But this is also not to be confused with beer nomics, which is while drinking, you are eating food. And everyone's happy. <laughs> So, a quick guide to service to beer ratios. So, a mate gets you a beer, you can pay him back with a beer. Uh, you help put together Swedish furniture, two beers. Help with a complex computer problem, six pack. If you're helping to move furniture, if it's less than a fridge and a couch, then well, that's worth a six pack. Uh, if you're actually helping to move a fridge and a couch or more, then the base is, well, a carton. And uh, if you're doing a Windows reinstall, that's a keg. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> uh, conversions, uh, just these are some rough lines for you, so uh, note that the Corona is less than or equal to an imported beer, unless it's summer in which it's fantastic. Um, the imported beer is less than microbrew. Now of course this is open to the beer -er and the beer -e to discuss between themselves, but this is just to be used as a rough guide and a baseline that you can work from and work with. So we've got to also consider taxation, which is if the payment you've received is greater than or equal to a six pack, then you're kind of obliged to at least share one of the beers with your mate who you've done the work for. Uh, if you've been paid in a carton, then it's uh, good to share a couple of your bounty, you know, it's like you, especially if you've had a carton, it's because you've done some hard work. Future developments, we're going to continue investigating beer karma, which is where if you get someone a beer, do you get that the next time you go out with them? We're also looking into online distribution of beer uh, for use of payment services. I was thinking to maybe call this beer coin, but uh, we're open to a few things. Uh, and as always, ladies and gentlemen, please drink responsibly. Thank you for your time. That's pretty tough to follow up. <laughs> I should have put some cat pictures in or something. So hey, everybody, my name is um, Patrick Schuff. 
Um, I'm a production engineer at Facebook, uh, and I'm a production engineer on the traffic team. So uh, we're responsible for all the L4, L7 load balancing at Facebook, and more specifically, I work on the traffic and CDN team, so we're responsible for efficiently del delivering photos and videos to any, uh, anywhere you are in the world. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, ProxyGen, our C++ um, HTTP framework that we recently open sourced. Um, so prior to um, 2011, um, load balancing at Facebook, um, we started uh, growing really fast and we had a lot of proprietary, um, both hardware and software solution, solutions to doing our, uh, our load balancing, um, TCP and SSL term. Um, and it was really clunky. Um, we had to log into web interfaces to do um, a shifting of traffic um, and keeping uh, consi configuration consistent across all of these different platforms and, uh, and softwares was actually really painful. Um, and also, anytime we wanted to support a new vendor, uh, new, or sorry, a new protocol, we'd actually have to talk to the vendors, um, work with them to actually get them included. And that was a very, very uh, long process if they would even uh, ex be willing to do it. So what did we do? We actually built our own um, web server. Um, when, when, the folks, when the software engineers at the time were uh, looking at this problem, um, there were a lot of ex existing solutions out there, um, Apache, you know, HAProxy, Nginx. Um, they were really fast, but um, a lot of them just had a, a ton of features and that we would never ever use. So um, we needed something that was really high performance. Um, so we opted to go a different direction and build our own. Um, so when we built it, it allowed us to really integrate well with our Facebook infrastructure. So we do tons of data collection, um, monitoring. It integrated well with our service discovery frameworks. And also we use Thrift, which is our RP, RPC serialization protocol, um, so that we could easily like, query our load balancers and configure them uh, remotely. Um, another really nice uh, uh, feature of this is um, we were able to reuse this code across a lot of our different products, um, as well as quickly iterate new, on new features. So um, how do we actually use it at Facebook? Um, we use a lot of the same libraries in our, both our client, our mobile clients today, Android and uh, iOS, as well as our servers. So when we, push, when we write code, it immediately goes out to both platforms, um, and then we can, um, it's really easy to use uh, for them to talk to each other. Um, so one anecdote here is um, HPAC, which is the header um, packing protocol. Um, one of our engineers, within just a couple of weeks, um, he implemented this feature. And, Easily, he was able to use it on both of our, our, our clients and our servers. Um, it allows us to move really fast. fast. Um, and this, these libraries have been uh, served many trillions of uh, requests at Facebook. So the good news is we've actually open sourced these libraries. So on November 6th of this year, um, we put our uh, libraries up on GitHub. Um, so you guys can check it out. Um, we have 376 forks, um, 215 stars. And uh, we, don't, we don't have a ton of pull requests. It's about 13. Um, but you guys, um, if you're interested in building a really fast web server, um, check it out. More information, um, you can check out our engineering blog. Ready? Yep, go. Okay. So, hi, I'm working with the SKA project. What is that? It's a big box with listening to the Big Bang. So, dealing with a lot of stuff. So, what are we doing there? We are involved, we have control of the design of the software development environment for part of the SKA. Took us a lot of time to get there and also contributed to other part of that. So in order to reach that, we had a lot of help for many people, many friendly faces in this room. Kudos for Catalyst to allow us to be alive in the last year. The New Zealand government, remember, we are doing stuff for you. And Australia as well. So in order to keep us alive and to gather more and more information, we do every year this little get together, which actually originated in LCA in 2010, in 2011. It was a mini conf. So this is happening in one month, and also we have a, a, a workshop there. But it's not just a fundraising thing, there are interesting things happening. And thanks, Bob Young, for the uh, advertising early in the morning. It's an interesting bunch of people coming all over the world just to uh, get together and talk with us, for us. So it's, it's really worth to come for it. Um, so some people ask me, how can I help? Well, the software development environment that we are designing and we have uh, another year and a half now to improve has a lot, these are just chapters where we 
need help. So I welcome contribution from all of you. And this is us. Open Parallel is just a New Zealand organization which works in the science data processor of the largest IT project in history, the central signal processor. And we believe that this is an opportunity to do federated work in pure open source model. It's an opportunity for countries like us, New Zealand and Australia, to really shape uh, how major architectures can be worked. I'm not sure it makes sense what I say, but thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Paul Foxworthy. I'm a director of Open Source Industry Australia. We're the industry body for organisations involved in open source, creating it, using it, and uh, one of the problems that we have often as participants in open source is there are areas we can't get into. So, for instance, many governments say they consult and they don't consult with individual companies, vendors, suppliers. They will consult with a peak body, an industry association. So uh, as an example, next week two of our directors are talking to New South Wales government. They're creating a new procurement policy. There's some wording in a draft that we really didn't, weren't happy with at all and they're quite agreeable to consultation so we're hoping something good will come out of that. It's the sort of thing that we do. So we're helping to support our members' businesses, grow them. We're helping to put people in contact with each other and also helping to build international contacts as well. So these are the sorts of things that we do. So please get involved. Join us. So these are things we've done over the last year and we're planning to do this year. And with more involvement, with you participating, then we can make sure that we're doing things that are important to you. So asaya.com.au, please join us. Thank you. This working? All right, excellent. All right, so um, you may, uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of you know what WebRTC is. <laughs> WebRTC is this really cool framework in browsers for real time communications. Now, it's um, available in uh, modern web browsers today, but what I want to tell you today is that uh, it is now usable to replace Skype. So, um, let me just show you. Where is the video? <laughs> All right, I'll get, I'll get my assistant to play the video. All right, so there we go. This is how uh, you set it up. You basically uh, go into Firefox, customize, you drag the hello button into your toolbar if it's not there already. Then um, when you click on it, you can start a new conversation. And then you'll see a little window pop up at the bottom. You can then copy a link to your clipboard and then send that to uh, Russell here. And then he's going to click on the link in his, and open it in his browser. And then um, once he's done that, there you go, he shows up in my browser. So, Sorry, can you get back to the video? <laughs> so this is the same thing, except Russell is sending me a link. And now I'm opening it in Chrome. And so I land on this page, join the conversation, allow the webcam and the microphone. And there you go, video conference. 
So back to the slides. Um, so the important part here is I, didn't install, I did not install any plugins, and I did not have to create an account for any of this stuff. It's just in the browser directly. It works in uh, Firefox 34 and uh, later. I'm not sure which version it got added to Chrome, um, but uh, it's, in late, it's in recent versions of Chrome. Uh, it's also available on Android if you use Firefox for Android. So um, please run this now. You can uh, get rid of Skype and use WebRTC. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Tobin Harding from the Central Coast of New South Wales. Um, last year at Perth I announced the foundation of a lug there, so I just wanted to give you a quick update and let anyone know who's from the Central Coast to come along. Um, so a fellow contacted me after last year and we kicked it off and it was just me and him for about eight months. I got progressively more nervous that he wasn't going to show up, but he did. <laughs> so um, that was good. And then two months ago we just got a flood of people. So we got um, three young fellows whose dads bring them along, and we also got three other professionals, or two other professionals, so four all together. So yeah, everything's going well. If you're from the Central Coast, come along, have some fun. Thank you. All right, is this thing working? Oh, perfect. All right, everybody, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about failing gracefully at 10,000 feet. Who am I? I'm Mark Smith. I'm an SRE at Dropbox, but very recently I'm a licensed private pilot. It's a lot of fun. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, I've been flying one of these around. A little single engine, tricycle gear, high wing. It's a lot of fun in the Bay Area. If you're ever out, hit me up. We can go flying. So what am I going to talk about? Everything breaks. I work in software. I work in reliability. I've been doing that for 10 plus years for places like Google, etc. Everything breaks. Got into aviation and thought, certainly aviation has a great track record for safety. It's one of the faces, safest forms of travel. It's got to be better. No Nope, everything still breaks. Seriously, everything breaks. But how do you deal with that? How do you actually deal with that in an institution where you've got hundreds of people on the line, thousands of people, etc.? Airplanes have handbooks. If you've ever seen them, they're 400 plus pages of things that break. Descriptions of what can break. Your alternator, your vacuum pump, whatever, it can all break. What do you do when it breaks? The important part is these books have how you respond, how you deal with that. So there are some procedures I want to highlight. When I went through my training, there were some things that jumped out at me like, why the heck would you ever do this in an airplane? Why does this make sense? For example, if your engine catches on fire while you're on the ground, you think, I want to run away from that. In fact, no, you actually want to keep starting it. You just keep going until your engine actually starts. Turns out this makes sense because if your engine starts, it blows the fire out, or it sucks the fire back into the engine, and you're good to go. Of course, if you follow, <laughs> if you follow the rest of the procedure, it says, if this doesn't work, run away and call the fire department. <laughs> so, you know. Also, force landing. You happen to lose your engine, you're up at 5,000 feet, you know, oh my, oh my god, what do I do? There's a long procedure, you're supposed to memorize it, actually, you just spend a lot of time training on this. But then you get to step 10, doors, unlatch prior to touchdown. So yes, you're no engine, you're coming into land, you're 300 feet off of some farmer's field, and you're telling your passenger, can you kick your door open, please? Like, what? <laughs> Turns out that actually makes sense, because the airframe can bend if you come down in a hard landing. So you kick the door open, so when it lands, you can still get out of the aircraft. So test pilots, I love them. They do fantastic, amazing things. I'm glad they have this job and not me. They've figured it all out. Um, another one, icing. If you happen to get ice on your aircraft, you fly into a cloud, do something terrible, that's a bad idea. But you get down to step number eight, open the left window, stick your arm out, and rub the ice off. <laughs> so fantastic. Uh, no ice in San Francisco. I love it. So whoa. Um, so the secret to failing gracefully in my last few minutes here, things will fail. Everything will fail. Understand that they will fail. Failure will happen to you. Your backups will not work. Your systems will fail. Your internet will go down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Plan for it. Understand that you will have failures. You need to think about it. You need to know what you're going to do before the engine's actually on fire. Not, don't figure these things out by the seat of your pants. And then test your plans. Actually go through your plans. Make sure that they work. The most important sentence I found in these handbooks, after an engine failure in flight, the most important task is to fly the airplane. <laughs> you think you wouldn't have to tell people this, but you do. So don't panic. Have a plan. That's how you fail gracefully at 10,000 feet. I'm Mark, S3 at Dropbox. <laughs> Thank you much. Um, so a few weeks ago, I forgot to enable kernel same page merging. 
uh, and got bitten by Linux's out of memory killer. And while I was waiting for everything to come back up, I did some work on a little song with apologies to Simon and Garfunkel. Um, it's only one verse long so far. Uh, I will take patches for the remaining verses, that's fine. Hello, um, killer, my old friend. My test VMs are dead again. Firefox with many tabs was creeping. Ate my RAM while I was tweeting. And the DIMMs that I put in my system were in vain. 16 gig remains. A space that's finite. Good to go. Turn it on. Uh, hi, my name is Angela, and uh, I worked at CERN, uh, the European Institute for Particle Physics, for eight and a half years. And uh, my sister pestered me into talking about it. So um, basically, it's really, really awesome. And if you want to do science, you should apply to work there. A lot of people ask how I got in. Basically, I applied. And I intended, <laughs> I intended to keep on applying until I reached the age limits or, and I couldn't apply anymore, but I got in on the second try. So you should also apply. There's lots of uh, fellowships. There's a summer student program. And uh, some of them are only open to people who are uh, nationals of certain member states. Um, but there's... Um, there are actually two places for New Zealanders for the summer student program where you don't even have to meet any of the requirements. I'm not exactly sure what this is called, but I know this because I met somebody when I got there who was actually a Canadian living in New Zealand who got this because no one else knew about it. So if you're a student and you want to do science, um, you should ask about that at your university. Um, it's a really awesome place to work. There's er, everyone's international, and um, if you if you need a break, you can go and see maybe a, f a famous physicist give a talk or something, um, or maybe someone else like uh, I've seen uh, Richard Stallman, Mark Shuttleworth, Vin uh, Vince Cerf, Douglas Hofstadter, people like that. If you don't go to CERN, you can download their talks online. Everything is at webcast.cern.ch. You can get the summer student lectures there as well. I watched a lot of them before I went there. Um, just to make this relevant, they do have their own distro. It's called CERN Scientific Linux, and you can download it yourself, I guess. Um, they also use a lot of Windows, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, oh, and the social life there is great. There's all sorts of clubs. There's a games club, a, a movie club, and they made, uh, some of my friends made a movie about zombies that is set at CERN. I don't know if you've heard of it, but you can get it at decayfilm.com. It's, it's um, really funny. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's all. You can talk to me about it later if you want. So. All right, I'm going to start. Drupal 8 development began in early, around this time, 2011. It's in beta now. It's nearly done, but it's not quite there. There's some gnarly, critical issues. So the Drupal Association said, right, we're going to fund a new initiative called the Drupal 8 Accelerate Fund. Uh, we're going to commit $125,000 to get Drupal 8 done. We're going to uh, have a committee decide how to spend that money. People will apply to spend that money and it will go and help free those developers who really know the nasty internals around those critical issues to spend some time to get it done. The tricky part is the board agreed to uh, fundraise half that money and I'm on the board. Uh, <laughs> So I thought, right, so I've got to help fund about fund about seven thousand, seven and a half thousand dollars. Did this a couple of years ago for something called Digitize the Dawn. Managed to do that by the skin of my teeth, and we got the di the dawn digitized, so that's awesome. And I thought, how am I gonna do this? Hmm. The great Australian tradition of a chook raffle. Apparently it's really hard to organise a chook raffle, so I thought I'd give it a go. And I've launched a possible campaign. So if you care about Drupal, actually even if you don't care about Drupal, <laughs> 
It's a fantastic open source content management system and it really is all about free software. It's GPL, an amazing global community. Please help us get D8 done. Find my D8 chook raffle on Possible and, and, and buy a badge. Thanks, I'm done. Um, hi, my name is Matt. Uh, this is Maya. We're part of the uh, Open Knowledge Foundation um, in Australia. Uh, we're here to talk to you about it because we've discovered that a lot of people are at uh, LinuxConf don't know about it, and we think it's really awesome, so we should tell you about it. So this is us. Um, that's our, our Twitter handle and our blog. Um, we do, you know, we're, we're the... Uh, what did Maya say we were? We're the, we, do, we, we do cool stuff and... You know, all the cool stuff. It's, it's just amazing. This is the hipster map of Melbourne. Um, we did this uh, mid, early to mid last year. Um, we you know, pushed all the hipsters out of all the hipster places because they weren't hipster anymore because we advertised them. It was fantastic. Um, that was about three nights that we did that for. Uh, there were about six or seven of us. It was great. Uh, what else do we do? we do? We do open government, open data, open tech, open software, open journals. We do science research, we do healthcare, we do digital humanities. All of the things. It's, it's great. Uh, we also um, played a, a fairly big part in GovHack last year. Um, there were, I think, 1,100 people in GovHack around Australia. Um, for those who don't know, it's a hack event that does stuff on government data. Um, and we got a whole bucket load of sponsorship for that. Um, I can't think of anything else to talk about about that, so I'll hand over to Maya. Cool. Thanks. Um, so, I mean, you all know GovHack as, you know, Peer War Initiative of Awesomeness. Um, it's sort of the best thing that the biggest thing that Open Knowledge Foundation does. But the way I tend to refer to it as, we're kind of the department for messing around and doing cool things. We're the sort of loose collective of people who do a bunch of things. I mean, Open Knowledge Foundation has existed for a while, but in Australia. Um, there's a bunch of us in a bunch of different cities and we do a whole heap of different kinds of things. Um, I went to GovHack and went, that's really cool, but uh, I'd actually really like to talk to the person who gathered this information. And I'm an ex-researcher, so I started, uh, like GovHack, but for medical research problems and curated. So I get a bunch of uh, scientists to come in and say, oh my god, I do this thing and it drives me mental and I'm sure you can automate it, but it takes me three days and I have no idea how to. And over a weekend, somebody makes their three-day task be three minutes and the click of a button, and they're delighted. Um, there's a whole heap of different kinds of events we do. A lot of them are about community building, so uh, come along, have drinks, meet everyone else in your city who does open stuff, and that's everything from open food to you name it, someone's doing it. Uh, you have a project, you want a solution, you want somebody to ask about some library, come along. Uh, and those kinds of drinks happen most cities, certainly Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, uh, I think WA as well. I don't know of any in Hobart um, or other places. Um, other things... Okay, so this okay. is a talk that I gave at the GStreamer conference in um, October, and it took 45 minutes there, so we'll see how we go. Um, <laughs> this is my boy, Arthur. He has two eyes, so he can see things in 3D. Um, he, ha he looks at one thing with one eye and uh, the other thing with the other eye. So this, this is an example of a 3D movie that I found on the net as a test thing. Um, 3D movies are delivered in many different ways. There is one official method um, that you never find movies in except on Blu-rays and there are many uh, there are unofficial methods that you find everything on if you go and look so the unofficial method that people use is um, frame, frame packing the, sorry all, the, all of them use some kind of frame packing pretty much the unofficial method it doesn't tell you about the fact that it's a 3D movie it just gives you two frames in there and you have to then t tell your TV or your video player that it is 
uh, a 3D movie. So there's official support for doing this kind of layout in H.264 movies or in MP4 container format or in MKVs, but no one actually uses it. They just give you a video file and you have to tell your things. There's also a, a very complicated format that's part of H.264 and MPEG-2 that is about encoding multiple viewpoints in a video file and using the fact that you've got a left eye and a right eye that's substantially similar in order to compress more tightly and use the reference information from each eye to compress them separately. Um, that's called multi-view coding in H.264 or other things. You can also use it for nice stuff like encoding a two-dimensional single eye view plus uh, a depth perception because you've got a lot of commonality between your depth um, frame and your 2D video frame and they get lots of compression gains from the redundancy. They can do much more than just left eye or right eye in multi-view things, so in fact they can use the fact that they've got cameras pointing all at the same event that are you know, five or six different views of a, a sports ball game that is uh, substantially similar from every view and they save compression with that. There's some other formats, MPEG-A have one, there's this format I found that Fuji do with their AVI cameras. Uh, there is stuff in MPEG-TS for doing stuff backwards compatibly where they give you an MPEG-2 stream that you can stream to your existing set-top box plus an H.264 stream that's more tightly compressed for your second eye. Uh, then we've got people, probably a lot of you who already have 3D TVs and HDMI 1.3, you just output video stuff and you have to go to the TV and then you have to tell it which 3D mode you're using. In HDMI 1.4, you plug in your Blu-ray player and it automatically tells the TV what kind of view you're doing. Uh, there's the other different kinds of hardware, like you get on your um, Game Boys with auto stereoscopy and um, lenticular views that means that you don't have to wear special glasses. Uh, there's lots of different ways we can output it in Linux. Uh, I'm targeting OpenGL with the work that I'm doing in GStreamer. There are output fallbacks like down mixing to the glasses, left eye red, um, red and green glasses that you used to see a lot. There's stuff that already exists for handling multi-view in GStreamer and I'm working on a new design that I can currently output to um, anaglyph down mixed stuff or... <laughs> 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 Start the clock, start the clock. Magic happens, or doesn't Your technical happen. problems are your own. Main screen turn on. <laughs> awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Akto. I want to talk about a little uh, open source project I, I kind of do on the side every once in a while called Dr. Ping, and it can ping a host. Uh, it can, <laughs> Yeah, you can also transparently ping IPv6, which I can show you here because we don't have it. It can also uh, ping several posts in parallel, which is awesome. But what I'm actually here to show you, because all of this is basically old, is an n cursor based uh, version of the thing that has a little pretty graph. And the graph in the top, this green here, that like grows taller as, as latency increases, that's new, and that's awesome. Uh, the green numbers are within 80th percentile. They're Yellow numbers are within uh, 95th percentile. The red numbers are uh, outliers above this. Uh, you can switch this to actually be, oh, that network is way too good, uh, to be a histogram. So <laughs> this single bit here is a histogram. And uh, if, if the network is flaky, it will spread out uh, and uh, uh, show you what it is. And also what I can't really showcase is a uh, box plot uh, of the data. So you, well, everything's a median now. So yes, and you can also, of course, do this with multiple uh, hosts. <laughs> so especially the, the coloring uh, of response times is very handy. And uh, home pitch is noping.cc. Uh, go check it out. Thank you. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, I'm Justin Clackety. Uh, I run a little company called Redfish Group. We do product design for various clients. Um, I'm also heading up a team that is developing AWP1, which is an open hardware, open source router. Um, that came about basically because we found with a lot of our clients we needed 
a decent high performance networking platform to work off and preferably we wanted that to be open hardware and we just couldn't find anything that was going to meet the need that we wanted. Then we finally bit the bullet to do this hardware in 2013 and of course that's when Snowden came out with all his um, revelations and confirmed our worst fears and then some. So we knew, okay, routers are broken and not only that, uh, state actors are actively exploiting this. So we thought, okay, well, let's look at what the problems are with the current routers out there and what we can do to help. And that's why we decided from a software perspective to use, to do a router as the first thing. So AWP1 is a hardware that's got a PowerPC on it, up to two gig of RAM, a gig of uh, NAND flash on it, a couple of MSATA ports, um, five gigabit Ethernet switch and two separate gigabit Ethernet ports. The software side of it, so with uh, the routing software, what we're wanting to do is fix things like the fact that routers tend not to get upgraded. So we're going to do package-based updates, supply those to whoever wants, make it automatic for those that just don't ever look at their routers and never update them. Uh, and also make sure they're signed because one of the problems that there is, so you've got OpenWRT, but it doesn't really have signed packages, although I think that they may have added that since. Um, and yeah, that's AWP1. So if you have any questions, either shout them out in the dying seconds here, or see me afterwards. You can follow me or find me on Twitter as Outrage as a Service because the world needs more outrage. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Okay, thank you everyone for coming along. Thank you to all of our Lightning Talk speakers. Please make your way out to the buses. They will whisk you off to tonight's Penguin Dinner. Uh, there will be buses running for the next hour.